Let's go, girls. Come on. From New York City to Los Angeles, Powered Up with Beck and Franklin is giving women of all ages permission to live the life they've always dreamed of. Why live in black and white when you can choose the brilliance of 3D and Technicolor? Each week, Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin and their high-powered guests will be here to cheer you on, to share their challenges, their successes, and what they've learned along the way. It's all about women supporting women. The stories and practical tips on sex, beauty, money, and so much more are designed to help you reconnect to the powerful woman you are. Fabulous knows no limits. Now it's time for you to expand your boundaries. Here are Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Man, I feel like a woman. This is Sandra Beck at Powered Up Talk Radio, and we have such an exciting show for you today. We're going to do things a little bit different over the summer. We are having some expert shows. We're doing some series. We've done a health series with Polly Monson. You're not going to want to miss that. That talks about fitness, flexibility, working out. She is from Central Sweat, New York. She does a $5 fitness class in Central Park. She is committed to women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s being their physical best. And she gave some of her best training tips in our four-part series. That's available on iTunes. It's available on Powered Up Talk Radio. And it's available on toginet.com. I don't know where you're listening to this, so T-O-G-I-N-E-T.com. We have another four-part series this summer, and that's with Merriam Webster. And Merriam Webster, she's really cool. That's Merriam with an M. And she is a energy healer. She's a 30-year psychotherapist, and we did four hours of recording that's going to run this summer. Um, you want to look her up, Mary M. Webster, same thing, Powered Up Talk Radio on iTunes. You can pick it up on uh, Powered Up Talk Radio or Toginet. And she walked us through an Everyday Bliss series that people pay hundreds of dollars just to attend to hear her speak. And I was able, because I'm a client of hers, I am a participant in her programs, no money was exchanged for this. It's simply me bringing tools for recovery, wellness, to power you up because not everybody can fly to San Francisco and take her seminar. Not everybody can go to New York City and uh take her $5 workout class and not everybody can fly to Oregon to to work with one of my long time dear closest friends she helped me through the loss of my mother she helped me through my divorce she's helped me with my children she's probably the only woman I know that's read the Bible more than once and actually knows what she's talking about. So she is kind of my faith guru. I like to go to her. I send my children to her when they have questions. Um, You know, we all need spiritual guidance. And part of being well and whole and healthy in recovery is handling the mon- the body, mind, and spirit. So, you know, we really hit the body. We we worked a lot with the mind and the everyday bliss with Miriam Webster. And now we're going to work on the spirit. And I am a Christian. Uh, Lisa is a Christian. And if you are not a Christian uh, listening to the show today, feel free to superimpose, you know, any of your uh, words for higher power or God. But for the purposes of this this show, we are using Jesus, we are using God, we are using terms like the Holy Spirit. I'm going to put that up front because if that's something that doesn't float your boat, this is not the show for you. And I'm sure there's many great shows out there for you, but I can only teach what I know. I can only bring to the airwaves what I experience, as does Lisa. These are our belief systems. We are solid in our faith, and we bring this to you today, a Women in Faith series. And today's topic, and actually we're going to do a four-part series on this. We're going to call it In God's Hands. And what I mean by that is that when you are in crisis, whether you're in crisis financially, your crisis emotionally, you're uh, fleeing from a, a bad marriage or an abusive boyfriend, or you have, you just can't handle your children anymore. And and where I really came to to learn about this stuff is you know, we've been in, in war in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, for 11 years now, and I have friends who have lost their sons. I have friends who have lost 
their children have lost limbs. I have talked to families on my other radio show. I can't even tell you how many whose children and parents and and relatives are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder with their loved one because that is something that affects an entire family. And Lisa and I have talked a great deal on this on my other military show, which is Military Mom Talk Radio. So if you're a military mom, you're going to want to tune into the episodes of Military Mom Talk Radio also on iTunes, uh, militarymomtalkradio.com and TogiNet to get information on this. So, So we really have it dialed in on what happens when things are in God's hands. And when things are in God's hands, I think everything's in God's hands, but there are times in our lives when we, we're more in God's hands than others. And I'd like to welcome Lisa Dietrich. She's coming in from Culver, Oregon, and she was one of my partners in crime down here in Los Angeles. She was lucky enough to escape, and she ministers to women up there. She is married to a pastor for how many years, Lisa? Uh, we'll be going on 27 years this year. 27 years. How many kids and how many grandkids? Uh, four kids, uh, three grandkids and counting. I'm hoping for more, but I don't push my kids on that one. <laughs> That's great. And you are, how many times have you actually really read the Bible, like from cover to cover? I've never even finished it once. Oh, my goodness. Um, let's see. The first time was in, I was in my early 20s and, and really struggling with my faith um, and I decided you know since I couldn't I couldn't figure out how all of these people on the radio and on TV and pastors were disagreeing with each other while holding the same book I decided to go and read the book for myself because I like to read and um, and it's just kind of gone from there how many times I would say I don't even know for sure maybe 10 12 times um, I, I can't say for sure something around there yeah, well, you know what, for somebody like me, and, you know, we've talked about this, and I'm going to be, you know, typically me, very open and honest about this, um, being a Christian my whole life, and, and I'm not going to dog any different group, whether it's Baptist, Christian, Catholic, you know, Lutheran, Methodist, um, I didn't learn a whole lot until I got into crisis, until my marriage was failing, I had a couple premature kids, my mom was dying, and it really started to question things. And the person I turned to most with respect to my faith was Lisa. And she gave me books like that book by Max Lucado to read. And, and she really, truly helped me walk through the navigation of finding your faith or refinding your faith or changing your faith. I don't know what it is, Lisa, ramping it up. <laughs> what do you call it when you have faith, but your faith gets deeper? Uh, strengthening, I would say. It's kind of like uh, muscles that don't get worked very much. Um, and it's usually when we come into some sort of health crisis that we realize we need to get into shape. And I think the same thing comes with our spiritual life, that uh, a lot of times it's a crisis situation where we stop and realize that maybe there's more to this life than just the the food and the drink and the and the fun, you know, and, and it's quite often just like you, Sandra, and and times of trouble that we turn to God. And, and the good thing is that he said, you know, call on me in, in your day of trouble and I'll be there for you. I'm paraphrasing. But, um, you know, and he's there. He's just waiting for us to turn around to him. Um, there's also some situations where people in it, this is more of a rarity because few of us reach the pinnacle of our success in life. But there are those who have gotten, you know, reached, attained all their goals and they're standing on the top of the mountain and they're going, and yet I still feel so empty. And they also quite often turn to God. So, you know, um, it's, it's times like when we're uh, times like that, when we're kind of looking around going, what else is there? I don't I still feel empty that we start turning and looking inwards to our own soul, our own spirit and saying, OK, I guess there's something to this faith thing and I need to pursue that. So that's where we are today. You know, when <clears throat> when you first like and I, I'm just going to put it in my own terms, but like when you first break, like for me. I was breaking in little pieces, but then there was one specific moment with respect to all that was going on in my life that I feel like I broke. Like I broke what it felt like was my heart was broken, my head was broken, and then I felt like my spirit broke in half. And when all those things go down, um, it's like your three thought centers, your gut, your heart, your head, and I guess four, your spirit, there was like nothing left. And 
you know, I turn myself over to God, and I know that sounds, you know, total AA. I'm not an AA person, but they always say, you know, hand yourself over to God. But I really got to that point, Lisa, where I was on my knees going, I can't do this, God. I can't fix this. I can't control this. I can't handle this. I need your help. I need you to tell me what to do. I'm completely in your hands. And to borrow another AA term, I completely surrendered into my faith. And it was the first time where I wasn't believing with my head. I wasn't believing with my heart. I wasn't believing with my gut. I wasn't even believing with my spirit. It was a cumulative, like I felt like I handed my whole self over to the mercy of God. And and I will tell you, things got better after that point. But that was a really big turning point for me. It is. And, and that's what that's what it takes. And unfortunately, most of us are pretty stubborn and we're pretty self-directed that sometimes, you know, we, we have to get to the point where we're broken down completely on the bottom and all we can do is look up um, to to find that faith. And and I, I was kind of in a similar situation as you, Sandra, that, you know, everything had fallen apart in my life and, and I was raised in the church just like you were. And and yet, you know, there's that period of time we go through as teenagers that we kind of go, eh, I'm going to do things my way and, you know, I'm going to. I'm going to do all these things. And, and it, it's a similar story. A lot of people have the same story that it wasn't until I was on the bottom and, and everything had fallen apart that I turned around and said, oh, oh, yeah, the, this God thing. Maybe there is something there. And, 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 and that's what the, God made us to have a relationship with him. And, you know, we, we as people kind of mess things up by trying to do things our own way and you know that's, that's all he's asking he wants all of us he wants every bit of you because if you're holding something back in a relationship then that's not a that's not a full and complete relationship and that's what he wants to have with us is complete he doesn't want us holding anything back and holding things back just just takes away from the beauty and the completeness of the relationship so yes you know you're you're absolutely right and when we put things into god's hands um, things do start coming into place. Uh, sometimes it's gradually. Sometimes there are definitely uh, pitfalls and, and stumbling um, along the way because, you know, we're we're still fallible. We're still people and, and stuff still happens that, that can kind of bring us down. But, um, you know, when we start strengthening our faith and growing stronger and trusting in God to bring us through those valleys in life, we get to the other side and we look back and go, wow. Look at what I accomplished with God's help. You know, I, I never could have done this if he hadn't take, been with me through all of this. And that, that makes us stronger right there, just like you well, say, it Sandra. Does. It does, you know, because I think, Lisa, you know, when you're talking about this, I think about, like, my lowest point was when I was first offered, you know, to get on this radio. And you remember those days. And, you know, yeah. I was talking to my buddy, Rick, uh, who was working with me at the time. And I said, Rick, I, I don't know anything about being on a radio show. You know, I've been... You know, it's been 20 years since I've been on the air. It's been 20 years since I've done anything. You know, I went to journalism school, and sure, I'm trained, but, you know, who's going to listen to me? What do I have to say? And I said, and, he you know, and he's like, sure, you could do it, Sam, you know, which is you know, so funny because, like, yeah, but you know I could do it. But he just said, sure, you can do it. And, you know, so I tried it, and I... I prayed so hard the night before, and, you know, my first show stunk. It was really pretty bad. But, you know, I saw the light turn on, and I thought, you know, later later on in life, I figured out, you know, whatever, 300 shows later, 400 shows later, I realized that, you know, God's will is amazing because he took me from these gifts of great communication and, and, and uh, opportunity with this radio station. And then he gave me a life experience, which I will tell you was pretty darn painful. It sucked a lot. And, you know, I got through it day to day. And as you said, it strengthened my face. That's a good way to put it. Um, and then we're here today building, you know, a women in crisis series and women empowerment series, you know, so that people can learn, you know, we all go through these things to a greater or lesser extent, but we all don't have to suffer the same bumps and bruises. And I want to tell everybody that it's okay, you know, in my case to pick up a Bible and look at it and go, oh, wow, that's <laughs> my first thing, Lisa, was it's really thick. There's a lot of words. 
And it looked like that nasty playing music when I was a kid for piano and it had all those mean little dots on the page that I had to figure out. And the pages were so thin and even though it was pretty on the side, it was completely overwhelming, especially for somebody who was broken. And I tried to do the Oracle thing, you know, where you open it up and it goes to a page, you know, and you read the page and you find something there that's the message. And, you know, I did that, but I was so confused because, and we've talked about this, I couldn't tell the city name from the person name. And, you know, there were so many words in there. And when I would ask people for questions, you know, I felt like such a, like a third grader in a 40-year-old body just going, well, I don't understand what that word means. Like when they told me to walk with Jesus, I was like, or my walk, that was it. They were saying, well, you have to be mindful of your walk. And I'm thinking, well, I'm wearing heels and you kind of have to tilt your hips forward, you know, and I, I really <laughs> I really didn't get that word. And, you know, my little guy, um, he was, we were at church and they said, um, you have to ask Jesus into your heart. And he looked at me and he says, mommy, is that going to hurt? Because he's like, and my older son was like, yeah, he's like, mom, if my heart pumps, is it going to squash Jesus? You know, when you're new to this stuff, it's real literal. And there's like a languaging or a, I don't know what you call it. We call it Christianese. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, you, you talk about, you know, going through the painful times. It's it's great. The series you did on on, on health training, I, I have to inject this here. I finally took one of those 30-day challenges. I'm on day five right now. And <laughs> no, day six, excuse me. And the first few days it was so painful. It's like I did the I did the squats and I did the all the crunches and sit ups and my whole body was just aching. And yet I knew that it was getting stronger and it was a good ache. And if we can keep that kind of perspective in our spirit, in our lives, and understand that the painful times we go through, unfortunately, that's usually what makes us stronger. When things are going along really well and everything's working out, we kind of, you know, kind of go into automatic pilot spiritually. And, and sometimes we maybe even forget about God. And, and it's not like he just drags us from one crisis to another to keep us remembering him. But when we do go through those difficult times, that's what makes us stronger. And it really does help us to become spiritually fit. And if we look at those difficult times with the perspective that, hey, God is here with me. And he's bringing me through this and I will be stronger when I get through this. And I'm going to learn a lot from this. Um, it really takes the edge off of the pain and the, and the agony that we're going through because we can look ahead with a better perspective and understand this isn't going to be the rest of our life. And even if it is, God's there with us and he's taking us through it. And, you know, it, it, it is a, our spiritual walk is a, has a whole lot to do with our perspective and our attitude about the things we're going through. Yeah, and feeling dumb when you pick up a book to help is not a great feeling. I'm, you know, I'm always here to give the, you know, the plain honest, you know, but, you know, I had heard enough that like when people are in crisis, they turn to the Bible. When people need faith, they turn to the Bible. So what I did was I borrowed, and I told Rick this one time, and I think I told you this, Lisa, I said, I thought God had forgotten about me, and and you know, I lost my faith. And I said to Rick, I said, you know what? And he was so solid saying, Sam, you know, you have to, ha you have to find your faith. You've got to get your faith back. You've got to build your faith. You've got to do these things and your life will get better. And I said to him, well, I'm going to borrow your faith until I can find my own. And I, I lived for probably three months on borrowed faith. And, and Lisa, that was the time that I told you <laughs> that it was like bowling for Christians. Like I couldn't go anywhere with without a Christian bumping into me, telling me that they're going to pray for me, telling me to come to church with them, offering me a, a Bible service, offering me a, what do you call it, a Bible study. Remember those days when I'm like, Lisa, what is going on here? They're like coming out of the woodwork. And it didn't matter where I was. It was, I remember I was working out in the gym, like an hour and a half away from my house because I got stuck there for work. And I'm pedaling on this exercise bike and I'm reading my, you know, book, pedaling on the recumbent bike. And some guy sits down next to me and he was older and I'm thinking, oh, great, dirty old man, he's going to hit on me. And so I just kind of like, you know, and he's like, hey, you know, what are you reading? And I showed him and then he said, I need to tell you something. And I said, what? Thinking like either he's going to bust the Bible or hit on me. And he said, you know, Jesus loves you. 
And I looked at him and I got chills. And I, I don't know who this man was. We didn't have a big conversation. And then he got up off his bike and he left. You know, that could have been an angel for all you know. I mean, for you, that was an angel. And, you know, and that's something that you, you talk about the, the Christianese and the walk. Um, that's part of being a Christian. And the Bible tells us that we're supposed to carry those who are weak for that very reason, Sandra, because we all have times in our lives when we feel very weak and feel very disconnected from God. And that's where if we reach out to other Christians, other believers, or just reach out to God and say, hey, I, I know you're there, but I, I just I'm, I, I got nothing. Um, he will bring people into our lives that will help carry us along. And we all need people like that. We weren't created to be islands. We weren't created to be alone. And, um, you know, if we remember that, that we don't have to go through anything alone, but we do need to be willing to give and take as, as, as our lives, as the ebbs and flows of our life um, require. Um, there are times when I'm very strong and can, you know, uh, help people and carry them along. And then there are times when I need someone that I can just climb on their back and say, carry me for a while. I'm, I'm just, I'm weak. And, and that's what the beauty of, of the church is all about. It's what it's supposed to be, is people being there for one another to help each other along through this journey of life and to help us grow closer to God in the process. Well, and it's funny that you say that about the, like, the climbing on each other's backs and, you know, uh, he ain't heavy, he's my brother or my sister. Um, right. When I first started learning some of this Christianese, you know, and it's so funny because I'm like, you know, we, you know, when, when, when I was raised, it's like Protestant had their own language, Lutheran had their own thing, you know, Catholics had their own thing. And then I came upon the word fellowship. And I know that sounds really funny, but the longest time, Lisa, I thought fellowship meant potlucks. <laughs> because, <laughs> because they said, come and join us for some fellowship. And I'm like, ooh, I wonder if there'll be meatballs. Like, because, you know, nobody ever sat down to me, or at least I didn't get it. I should say I didn't get it because it's not anybody else's responsibility but mine. But I kept, when I was doing my church services, like I'd go to all these different churches and I would try them out and see what fits and see what spoke to me. And mm -hmm. and they'd all say, like, join us for a fellowship after. And I'm like, ooh, is there going to be barbecue? Are there going to be meatballs? And that's really, as an educated woman with a, you know, a master's degree from Northwestern University, I want people to know that education doesn't mean you get it because <laughs> I didn't get it. And I really thought fellowship meant, like, barbecue potluck and can you explain to me what fellowship really is? Because now I know it's more than that. But when you're new to some of this stuff, these terms like a fellowship, you know, to me, it was just a barbecue or food. Uh, well, and, and I can understand your, your, your uh, interpretation of that because usually there is food involved. <laughs> but it, what it really is about is, is getting together and forming relationships within this group of believers and like I said, food usually brings them in because, you know, it's kind of like if you build it, they will come. If you have food, they will come. And it's just a matter of building relationships and getting to know people and then um, uh, building friendships from there. Um, hopefully that's the way it's supposed to work. We're supposed to be working together. We're on the same team. And, um, and yeah, <laughs> and fellowship is definitely one of those Christianese words, I guess. I, I think it's kind of grown from that um it, I, I think there were there were, i can think of like in college there are fellowships as well where it's a you know group of people studying a specific thing together but um it doesn't necessarily involve food so don't be disappointed if you go somebody invites you for fellowship where's and there's no food where's my meatballs <laughs> where's my meatballs <laughs> um it's just you know gathering around food breaking bread together is something that every human being does, although a lot of people don't eat bread now. So we have gluten-free bread at our fellowship. <laughs> we've actually introduced, we've actually introduced gluten-free communion bread. Can you believe that? Um, just to make sure we don't make anybody sick. Um, but it, it's just a time of getting together. I mean, call it a party, call it a get together. Um, it's just a matter of, it's, it's a time where we can get together and get to know each other better. That's all fellowship is. Well, and I really didn't understand fellowship on a lot of levels, Lisa, and I think a lot of women can relate to this, and I know, you know, you probably can too. You know, sometimes, like, you know, just by the virtue of being a stay-at-home mom, I have friends who are stay-at-home moms, and they really become very excluded. Or if you're like me, you're in an abusive relationship, and that relationship 
naturally excludes people, you know, just by, by the virtue of, you know, you're hiding things and you're being hurt and then your partner is making sure he doesn't get found out. So it starts excluding things. So you get kind of like all weird and rusty. And then when you go to these things, you feel so vulnerable because first of all, your social skills are in the toilet. And then you get there and sometimes like all I, all I did was the lady who cried in the meatballs because it was so overwhelming that people would even say hello to me. You know, it wasn't you know, like that they were hugging me, though. A few people did hug me weirdly, like when my mom died and they came up in the church and they said, I'm so sorry for your loss, hugged me and said, I've been praying for your mom, Gloria. Totally creeped me out because I wasn't used to that. And I, you know, we live in a society where everything isn't what it seems, like everything seems upside down. What the Bible says, society does the opposite. What they glorify, society does the opposite. And so I, I didn't, I couldn't receive an authentic hug and wish over my mom from a stranger. And I said that to one of the girls I go to church with. And she's like, Sam, she's not a stranger. She's your sister in Christ. And she doesn't have to know you. We prayed for your mom. We all prayed for your mom before we knew you. And that was something really foreign to me. And, um, and, and you, there are a lot of different situations in our life where we do feel isolated. And um, single parenthood, I think, is one of the most difficult times because it's it's not just, you know, a few months or a couple of years. It's almost a lifetime or, you know, half a lifetime. We, we've got children for 18 years and, you know, single parenthood is a, an extreme example of isolation. But we all go through those periods of time and, and seasons in our life where we do we can feel isolated and um, and I totally understand what you're talking about. Um, and as a pastor's wife, I feel that to some extent because there are people that um, are afraid, you know, like you say, we all have things that we want to hide. And from a minister's family, you know, I, I don't want to be put on a pedestal or, or, you know, I don't want people to feel like I'm any different than they are because I'm not. But just by nature of the position uh, it is isolated. You know, there are people that don't want to get close. They don't want to be uh, in a position where they think I might, you know, rat them out or whatever. And I'm not like that. I, I would tell you, because I didn't know you were a pastor's wife when I met you. I don't even remember how we met. I know we met through Rick in that church, but I don't remember what I knew about you when I met you. And I don't know even, I think we talked about work. I think we talked about that army job I was doing, you know, the go army homes job. And I needed, you know, somebody who had been in the army and somebody who understood technology and family. And you're like, Oh yeah, you know, you should meet Rick. I think that's kind of how you and I met. I, I don't remember. It's a little foggy, but if I knew you were the pastor's wife, I would have steered clear like, a mile wide because I'm broken. I'm messed up. I've got a disastrous family. The last thing I'm going to do is put myself in front of somebody who's in front of the church as the pastor's wife, seemingly perfect. And you know, that's where, here's another Christianese term that I love. Our meeting was what I believe was a divine appointment. And, oh. um, you know, God brought us together uh, through a mutual friend who invited you to church. And she had told me for months that she was trying to get this lady that was going through a difficult time. And we were praying for you. I didn't even know you. I hadn't even met you yet, but I was praying for you. And, um, you know, you finally showed up and you were a little bit nervous <laughs> and uh, understandably so. And and I'm glad you didn't know I was a pastor's wife because I, I think we, you know, we went and, and talked and I, I was, I really opened up to you in a way that I rarely do with anybody. Um, but I think that's kind of what, what built the bridge because we've had some similar circumstances in life. And, um, so, you know, but I, I do consider our, our friendship to be a divine appointment and I, I look for those. I, I really, um, you know, I've opened my heart up to where, um, you know, I look for opportunities to reach out to people and, um, and that's kind of what this faith thing is all about as well. Well, and I, you know, and I want to share with women just a little of our history, if that's okay with you, Lisa, um, you know, mostly from my point of view, and you can chime in on your side, you know, where you want to divulge things, but, you know, what you were talking about, because there's women out there that are, are going to listen to this and are in the same place, especially for me, that I was, um, 
at my low points when I, you know, my children were really tiny, you know, like what Zach, I think was three and Max was five or six. And, you know, I, I, my mom was dying and I was out in California all alone, you know, 3000 miles away from my family. And my ex-husband now ex-husband had left me and had left me for a woman that they worked for that worked for both of us. And they set up their life and everything was hunky dory for them. And they were going to Disneyland and Legoland and Santa Monica Pier. And, you know, I just felt like my life was just spinning and as pathetic as it sounds when you move to a new neighborhood and you have really no very few friends or very just acquaintances no longtime friends um I ended up at was it Jack in the Box I would go to Jack in the Box and I would you know I didn't want to balloon up to 900 pounds so I would only order a small french fry and a large diet coke and I've written about this on sandrabeck.com and I would I would go in there because it was lit and it was fairly safe and I wouldn't climb the walls in my home because I didn't know anywhere else to go. And I hate to say it, but it never occurred to me to go to church. (laughs) But I went to fast food and I was sitting in the parking lot for months. I would sit under the sign and sometimes Ignacio, he's the night manager, would come out and give me something different to eat, you know, on the house and tell me it was going to be okay. And, mm. you know, he would say things like this, this will pass, this will pass, Miss Sandra, I'm so sorry you're going through whatever you're going. And I never really talked to him. I would just sit there and cry. And then that's that lady, Denise, the common friend of ours, who I'll always be grateful to, Mm -hmm. said, you know, please come to this church. Just come. Bring your kids. They're really nice people. Just try it. And I was scared to death, Lisa, the first day I walked in there because all these people turned around and looked at me and some were older and some were younger. And there were like two or three what I felt like friendly faces. And then there were some not so friendly faces. It was a really hard choice for me to make just to bring my kids and walk in the door. And so anybody out there listening to this know that if you feel the same way, you know, you're going to feel weird and creepy and scared and awful. And and I think I cried through the whole first service. I don't remember. Do you? No, no, I don't remember. (laughs) But I do remember at one point. I was holding Max and either you or Al, you know, Rick and and Jeff and Scott, you know, were up there singing and and, uh, I used to call them the hot God bod squad because they were such handsome young men. It was not really hard to look at and they could sing. So that was good, too. But I remember (laughs) thinking at one point, least that you were holding Zachy and he was God, he was so tiny. I think he was three or four. And I was holding Max and we were singing And I looked over at you and I thought, oh, my God, like I have a friend. I have a friend in faith. I have a and it was such a weird feeling. I will never forget that moment. I just looked over at you. You had your arm around Zach. He was on your hip. And then you had one hand up. And I know we were singing. How great is your God? And I will never forget that moment. And it was just so surreal. Oh, and like I said, I I know our meeting was a divine appointment, Sandra, and I I would definitely encourage anyone that whether you're going through a difficult time or just seeking to strengthen your faith, please do seek out churches. Um, And and, and what you did, you know, going to different churches is fine, Um, you know, because each one has a slightly different flavor to it, I guess you could say. And, you know, the important thing is you get in there and you get you you kind of get connected to God and, and find fellowship find relationships with other believers of like mind and so that we can work together and carry one another and 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 seek and you know follow god together um i i I don't remember i mean i remember meeting you and i remember those early times and 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 you know i i think the most important thing is that you you were willing to come back and kind of open up and and bring the kids and and sometimes it takes more than one or two times i kind of have a rule of three where um, you know, if you're seeking to find a church, go three times in a row, um, three weeks in a row. And that kind of gives you a, a good understanding of how things are, because I've been to churches. You go one time and, oh, there's a guest speaker. You have no idea what it's like there or, you know, everybody's out at some retreat or something. So um, I definitely would encourage you to, to you know, go to a church, you know, three or four weeks in a row. Um, if it doesn't really seem to fit, then go seek out some others. And um, but seek, you know, and you'll find. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's so true. And, you know, not only does the church change, but you change. Like, and I'm just going to say this. Like, if I went to try this church on the day before my hormones kicked in for that certain time of the month, <laughs> oh, forget it. It's like, unless the communion neighbors were wa- made of chocolate. I mean, now that's something I should say. If you did chocolate-flavored communion wafers, you'd get every PMS woman in the seats. <laughs> Chocolate-covered communion. I, I like it. <laughs> yeah, don't you? Wouldn't that be so? Grace would be like, there's be the line for the communion, and then anybody who's PMSing or having a hard day, here's the chocolate line. I bet you that line would be out the door. That's hysterical. <laughs> yeah, but it's changed. You know, that's my point is that, you know, how you feel one Sunday, you know, might feel differently. Like, you know, when I was dragged into court a lot by my ex-husband and his girlfriend, you know, there were times when I would come into church and I would feel like I was stoned. I don't do drugs. I never did. But I, it's a, what I would imagine to feel stoned like, like a bubble around me. And I was just such a sense of unreality. And I could just sit there and like lay all my troubles before God. And I didn't even know if I sang or stood up. I think for a while I just, Rick told me I sat in the back and cried for weeks. I, I don't remember that. But then again, I was a train wreck. So, you know, it is what it is. Well, and when we're going through very difficult times, it does feel like kind of bu- a bubble. Um, you know, we're talking about similar instances in life, and I and my mom also died of cancer. Actually, both of my parents died of cancer. But um, I remember, especially with my mom, that I that you know, from the time we found out until after she passed away, um, I was in this bubble, and it was like you know, the bubble around me was the immediate taking care of a sick uh, family member. And the world around, you know, outside of that bubble was just a blur. I don't remember a lot of things that that happened during that period of time. But what I do remember is the friends of mine at church, our our church had a very good, uh, strong prayer group. And the friends that were praying for me during that time, I quite honestly felt like there was a warm blanket over my shoulders through that whole time in that bubble of trials and I, I always remember that and, and pray that for other people that I know are going through difficult times, that God's spirit will just fall on them like a warm blanket of comfort. And that's what we can give to one another. And that's, you know, if you go into church seeking, you know, comfort, that that I just pray that that's what you find when you get there. Well, and to give it a chance. Like, that's the one thing, like, you know, today I really want to talk about, like, you know, you know, that we all need help and, you know, how to choose a church and, you know, like what it should feel like, because, you know, when you first choose like that and you're in trauma or you're in crisis or you're in distress, it's like you change and you may change your church over time. And it was funny because, you know, I thought I should feel immediate relief and I felt like guardedly good the first time I just can remember like well and then I thought to myself I should go back so I went the second time and I think the second time um Rachel was there your daughter and I think I just remember her and Zachy and I'm probably getting the sequencing wrong but it doesn't really matter but your daughter Rachel who was what maybe 13 maybe 14 at the time I don't remember uh, she played with my kids, and then there were a couple other of the girls, Aaron, Aaron uh, came over and played with the kids, and the kids had a great time, they were like the only kids there, this was mm-hmm. at the edge, right, mm-hmm. and then you guys did chips with, I know this is awful, but you guys did chips with <laughs> like cheese sauce, and I was like, oh my god, and as a single mother, soul supporting on her own, and I know this sounds ridiculous, but to go somewhere and have some food that I don't have to pay for, don't have to prepare, don't have to leave a tip. And I could just stand there and enjoy and eat some, some, and it was just junk, you know, it wasn't like a four star meal, but it might as well have been for somebody like me who was so burned out and just so exhausted by life. And that's the other reason we usually introduce food into the fellowship, because we know (laughs) there are people in that situation as well. Yeah, Um, who just, you know, it's like you don't have to be a shut in to, you know, and, and homebound, you know, for, for to go to church and come and be grateful for a donut or grateful for some chips or grateful for, you know, I remember when the older boys and they were teenagers, like old teenagers were trying to drink 
teach Zachy to drink out of the soda bottle. Remember, he poured it all over his face. <laughs> and he had the time of his life. We all did. And all of a sudden, it was like I went from living in a vacuum to my little guys having these big brothers and these big sisters. And then what I considered some like quasi aunts and uncles. I mean, you remember those days. It was just me and the two kids. Right. And, and see, that's what that's what church is supposed to be about. And if you go to a church and people just stare at you when you walk in the door and I, I, I have to I have to admit, I mean, when we're on vacation, we visit other churches and we've gone to churches that we felt so cold, we'll never go back to. And I, and I just it breaks my heart to know there are congregations out there like that, that, you know, you can go in, sit down, go through a whole service and not even speak to anyone because everybody's kind of in their own little bubble. Um, but that's not the way it's supposed to be. And if you visit one church that's like that, go go visit another one. I guarantee you, you won't get that same treatment everywhere. Um, and, you know, w but the churches are made up of, you know, fallen human beings also that are trying to seek out their path and find God. And so don't don't judge the Christianity as a whole by your experience in one church. Um, visit other ones. Go get involved. And even if you do find that, and maybe you're in the area where that's the only church around, um, sometimes we have to put ourselves out there a little bit too and, and, um, you know, um, try to make that little part of the world a little better. Um, and I, I don't like to say that, but <laughs> I'm going to be perfectly honest. There are churches that are just kind of cold and broken and, um, you know, we need to get ourselves plugged in and, and really, um, try to make a difference in the world around us. So where am I going with this? We, we, well, I just, I just, you know, like you, keep got, going. you got to give it a chance and you got to find the right fit. And, you know, when the, the, the church that we were with, when, when, you know, like when you and Al left, it just wasn't the same for me and the kids. And, you know, some of the, you know, a lot of people moved on, um, you know, as a result. And, so I was churchless for a couple of weeks and I started my, you know, my like search again. And I want to tell people what my search criteria is because I think it's real. My search criteria for a church was it couldn't be too far. It couldn't be too loud. It couldn't be too progressive. It couldn't be too static. And I wanted to come out of church feeling happy and uplifted. So that was important to me. And then the other two things is it had to have a great kids program and a, and a parents program for my dad. And then it needed to have like convenient parking and near to services. So I knew I was going to stop going to a church where I can't find parking or I know I need to go to the grocery store every Sunday I do my cooking for the week and I get my groceries and if I have to drive extra for all that I know there's just not enough bandwidth in me to do that so I actually sat down and made a list of what I was looking for those external criteria that were important to me and then I had to you know find I visited only those locations that fit that criteria. And it was funny because I ended up at a Lutheran church of all places. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it fit all those criteria and I, I like it and it's, it's got good music. I like the pastor and I like the message and, you know, it's parking and it's near the store. And if I need to get lunch for the kids right after, cause we stayed for something and they loaded up on cookies, it works. I mean, so you can find it. It, it just takes a little time. It does. And I think everybody has their own criteria. I think most people, um, you know, when they first go to into a church, um, they want to be a little bit anonymous. I don't know. Um, some people like getting attention. I personally, when I go into a church and they make new, you know, visitors stand up while they all clap, it just, I just shudder at that. It just, that, that's to me is horrifying, but I'm more of an introvert. So it would be, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, it was hard for me the first time I moved to California um, and I went to one of these churches where people clapped. I was like, oh my God, what is, what? You know, and now I'm more used to it. Um, and then I wasn't used to loud, you know, kind of Christian rock music. Now I love it. But the first time I heard it, I was like, oh my God, what is this? What, what, God, what, God? You know what I mean? Like, oh my God, like I'm literally talking to God going, I've never really heard anything like this. It's not Baptist. It's not Christian. It's not, you know, the the not uh, Hava Nagila from, you know, my my Jewish training and stuff. It just 
was foreign to me, but it wasn't foreign bad. And once I gave it a chance, I was like, hey, I kind of really dig this and the kids like it. And, and, you know, giving things time, giving it a little time to see if you really like it is important too. And I love your three week rule or your three try rule. Yeah, I, well, I use that rule of three in a lot of things. If I'm if I'm uh, shopping for something online or you know calling around, um, I'll I'll do the rule of three on a lot of things. It's not just church, but that kind of gives you an idea of what's really available out there. And um, but what I would also recommend is don't don't make it a habit to hop churches. Once you find one that you feel like is a good fit and it meets your criteria, get plugged in. You know, place your membership there and really get involved. Um, don't be afraid to get a little bit dirty and 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 work there um, because you know if churches are all volunteer for the most part and um, you know and it, you really don't understand how fulfilled you will be until you start giving. It sounds weird, sounds like it shouldn't work that way, but when we start actually participating and and using our gifts and talents to serve God and serve other people. All of a sudden, we walk away feeling very, very fulfilled and very joyful in our in our lives, no matter what's going on, because we're we're serving. We're, we have something to give, and um, and in return, God helps us to feel fulfilled and feel good. So, um, you know, I would definitely, and you know, if you if you get your feelings hurt, um, just deal with that and and go on. Deal with the person, talk to the person, and uh, move forward. I was it was interesting. I was talking with somebody the other this last week who's family has some family members that will never go to church because they got their feelings hurt once. And I said, you know, I've never heard anybody say, I am never going to go shop grocery shopping again because somebody was rude to me in a grocery store one day, or I'm never going to work again because I had a mean boss once upon a time. Why do people do that with churches? <laughs> you know? Just yeah, I agree. Sense. You know, and I will tell you, like, you know, I went to one church after your guys church and I started going there for like, Maybe, I don't know, six or eight weeks, and there were a lot of things I liked about it. But then the pastor made fun of Christians, or made fun of Catholics. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute here. You know, if you're the pastor, and it wasn't just an aside joke. It was like, you know, what is it with the Pope? And I'm like, okay, J the Jerry Seinfeld of pastors, sit your fanny down, because there's a lot of Catholics in this room, I can tell, because, you know, you can always spot them. Because when they say the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they all make the sign. You know, so we kind of give ourselves away. And I thought, aren't we supposed to be unified in Christ? not you know and it's one thing for somebody to give their opinion it's another thing for a pastor to stand up there and make fun of another Christian religion and I thought hey that's not cool so I really didn't I never went back to that church after that and I chose a different church but that was because of the words the pastor said and it's like he's supposed to lead me in my faith and teach me and then I was like whoa what are you teaching me but I didn't I didn't blame all churches for that I didn't blame all Christianity for that I didn't care for that person. I didn't care to be led by him. So I moved on to find somebody and I, the person that I love now, Pastor John Cosman, uh, he's outstanding. I, I, I will listen to his sermons when I can't make it to church. I download them online. That's how good they are. Good. And yeah, and, and there are times like that. And, and um, there, what I would recommend if possible to at least, you know, if you're offended by something a pastor says, see if you can meet with them or at least send them some feedback so that they kind of hear that, hey, maybe they shouldn't be saying things like that. Um, but I think in your situation, if it's the one I'm thinking about, um, not sure if that would have worked, but I, I would always recommend, you know, going to the pastor because sometimes, you know, and being a pastor's wife, I know sometimes he says things and I'm sitting there going, uh, uh, wh what did you just say? <laughs> Which I try to read his sermons beforehand and, and kind of, uh, go through that. But, um, you know, it, it, I think it's just as any other um, public person, um, they, they do appreciate feedback. And, um, and I agree, you know, we shouldn't be bashing other uh, faiths, other um, avenues. But um, again, we, we also need to be in an environment where we are being led that the, the pastor is shepherding us. Um, and, and, you know, and I'm glad you found that. And, you know, being from a Catholic background, I think a Lutheran church is probably a really good. Yeah, it was a very progressive fit, you know, for both of us. Mm -hmm. And it does take time to find that. And, and you do as you grow um, what you'll also, you know, sometimes we find that as we grow in our faith and and life changes, um, 
we may be finding ourselves moving to different churches um, just because of our seasons in life. I mean, just like Al and I moving out, you know, leaving California and coming up here, um, that was God's timing as well. Um, and it's just been a, a beautiful thing. I hated to leave behind you and my friends there, and yet it's all working out great. And um, and I'm so happy that you're still in church and, and that your kids are doing well. And, um, you know, and, and we just need to um, allow God to move us forward in our lives. Well, and to also recognize that churches change and churches evolve. And, you know, like this this Lutheran church, you know, a year ago became a what I don't know if you call it a general Christian church, but, you know, it had a Lutheran background, but now it's Christian, you know, and they welcome all Christians. And, you know, that was something that was really attractive to me because, you know, we don't want to um, – you know, we don't want to move away from our faith because a representative of a faith let us down. Right. And we need to remember that we're following God and not necessarily the pastor. So if the pastor leaves, we don't have to leave the church and follow the pastor. Um, and that's where I really do encourage reading the Bible. And I know, Sandra, we have to get back to that because there are a lot of churches. And even here, people come and tell my husband, wow, you preach out of the Bible. You know, the other churches we went to, they just tell stories for 45 minutes. And we really do, I mean, God has given us his word. And there's a lot in there, I know. But we need to just break it down and take it one book at a time because it really is a little library. And, Sandra, I, I, I crack up at, you know, you say that the Bible looks so intimidating to you. And yet I look at the stack of books that you read every week, and that intimidates me like you have no idea. <laughs> I know, but they have pictures, and they have pretty colored covers. <laughs> so I did tell you, when I bought that Adventure Bible, you know, or you bought it for my kids, um, yeah. I'm reading it because it works for me. You know, it's like a magazine version of the Bible. And, you know, Lisa, we're going to, um, you know, we've got about 10 minutes left in this show or maybe eight minutes. So, um, But our next episode is going to be all about, like what is the Bible, how to choose one, you know, because you go to those Christian stores, man, and there's a million of them. So, you know, we're going to we're going to save that, uh, you know, for this, our intro class, if you will, because that's what this is, uh, allows us to to explore some of these things of where people are when they're coming back to faith or strengthening their faith. This show really isn't about people who are solid in their faith and they have their beliefs set and they're strong and they, they know which Bible to choose. You know, this is like the idiot's guide. This is what I needed, you know, three years ago or four years ago, maybe five years ago. Now I can't even remember that you gave me personally. That's why I chose you to do this women in faith series in God's hands because you were the one who walked me through this when I did the uh, mindfulness training and the energy movement from the, with the psychotherapist. She was the one who helped me and Polly Monson helped me. So all I can bring is what worked for me as a teacher. We can only, you know, teach what we know. And right. what I know is you're the best in the business when it comes to this stuff, at least for me. And I hope for everybody else. Well, thank you, Sandra. I I, the, I, I don't feel like I know much, but um, <laughs> I, I'm kind of on this journey with you and, and we're all learning as we go along. Um, and, you know, and, and my heart is just that um, to grow closer to God and get to know him better, we, we kind of need to take that step, whether it's, you know, going to a church or opening the Bible or, you know, uh, maybe asking somebody that we know is a Christian, can you just sit and have coffee with me? Can we just talk? Um, you know, there, there's lots of different ways that we can take that step and, and kind of reach out and, and start working on strengthening our spiritual uh, life. And uh, but what I would say as far as churches, though, if you go into a church and you don't see a Bible, nobody opens a Bible, the pastor doesn't even have a Bible, no mention of God, you, you know, if they just stand up there and tell stories, I mean, heck, you could go to a motivational conference for that. You know, um, the, and, and uh, you know, I just want to make sure that you understand that there's there are some criteria, you know, if we're talking about our spiritual life and our faith, that's important stuff. And I'm not going to say all churches are created equal. Um, we want to make sure that we find one that's healthy and well balanced and actually does seek to serve God. Um, and that notwithstanding, um, you know, I, I love the fact that I thank you so much, Sandra, for having opened up this forum to me. Um, I just, you know, my feeling is I've, you've encouraged me to write. So I'm doing a lot of writing now. 
And, you know, any way that I can get the message out there that, that God loves you and he wants to have a personal relationship with you. Like I tell my kids, he, he wants to be your BFF, your best friend forever. Um, we just need to kind of turn around and say, hey, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let, let's let's talk. And um, that's kind of where I'm coming from in this journey of life. Well, and I think because you're a mom, you're a girlfriend of mine, you can speak to me and I think you can speak to other women in ways. And I'm just going to say this, that maybe uh, like, like, you know, some of these dad pastors, that's what I look at them. They look like a dad or a grandpa pastor or the young man pastor. You know, they're all real good, I'm sure. And they know their stuff. But there's nothing like relating friend to friend and having somebody say, this worked for me. You know, this is how I do it. Maybe you would like to try it because it takes a lot of the unknown out of it. And then you can try it on. It's like a shoe. You know, it's like the shoe didn't fit Lisa or the shoe fit Lisa. So we go to the store and we buy, you know, the same shoe. Or I think we ended up with the same bathing suits once at a party from Costco. Um, (laughs) I think there was three of us there at that time. But it's kind of the same thing. And, And, you know, messages are sent and received through friends, well-meaning friends, and in my case, I'm lucky to have this, like, you know, highly educated, successful uh, woman to lead me in areas where I don't know, because we can't know it all, you know, and I know things, Lisa, that you don't know, you know things that I don't know, but because we come from, I think, a a a position of humbleness, of service, of gratitude, of love, of fairness, and really genuine caring for the other person, we can share these things and both grow together. And so my advice, if you're looking for a friend or you meet a friend at a Bible group or a study group or a church, make sure that you check that heart meter and not just your head meter and your gut meter. Because one of the things I'm going to tell you from personal experience about meeting Lisa is like I liked her with my brain. Like, oh, she's very smart. She can explain these things to me. That's good. But then I listened to her with my heart, and I'm like, wow, I think she really cares about me. And I felt that one time where we sat at my kitchen table when my mom either had just died or was dying, and she held my hand and and prayed with me or prayed for me. And I really felt that heart connection. I'm like, wow, this person really cares for me, has my best interest in heart and doesn't want anything from me. That was huge, especially because I used to work in Beverly Hills with famous people. So most of the time people want stuff from me and that I didn't feel that. And then the last one was my gut check. Like, does this feel good? Does this feel right? And after I went to church with her, after I prayed with her, after she gave me some books to read, my gut instinct said, oh, my God, this is where you need to be. This is what you need to hear. This is what you've been searching for. This is what's been missing. So I listened to her with my head, my heart, and my gut. And then I found that my spirit filled up. And I started to feel stronger. I started to feel richer. And so I'm going to take you guys on a journey on our next show. And I know this sounds silly, but if you were like me, you walk into one of these Christian bookstores, where do I start? Where do I begin? There's tons of books on Amazon. We're going to talk about how to choose a Bible, how to choose a study group, what it should look like, how we can use it. And it's going to be great. So any of you struggling, I hope that this helps you find your faith on behalf of Lisa Dietrich and myself. This is Powered Up Talk Radio. Tune in to next week, or if you're listening to this in podcast, look for our second show in the series, Women of Faith in God's Hands. Thank you very much. This is Sandra Beck, and we'll see you on the next recording. We're so glad you joined us for Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. Sandra Beck, Los Angeles-based single mother and technology company owner, knows what it's like to be fit, funny, and fantastic in your 40s. Linda Franklin, a New Yorker with a successful marriage and prominent career, is the brains behind The Real Cougar Woman. She shares her wisdom, grace, and laugh-out-loud opinions based on her stellar successes, both in the financial world and in her personal life. Check out our website, poweredupwithbeckandfranklin.com, and join us next week for another great conversation. We're here every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific, right here on toginet.com.